So today, um, I was actually in the same class as Hannah when she did her paper on foot washing. And um, I was also in the same or in a different class with Dr. Pasek about basically diving into the scripture, into the word, and really seeing, not from like a biblical criticism standpoint, but like, how does God speak to us through the word? And so I really love scripture. I wanted to thank both Dr. Tasek and Dr. Word. Dr. Word, you contributed to me being able to criticize and really dive deep into what scripture is actually saying and how like, you know, how it's written, redacted, etc. Dr. Tasek, you on the other hand, showed me how God speaks to us despite these flaws, despite the whole, uh, historical inaccuracies, etc. What is the actual point of the scripture saying? And I appreciate it very much. So, without further ado, this is Daniel, the archetype of Christ. So, in the Jewish Tanakh or the Hebrew scriptures, there are three different types of prophets. There's major prophets, minor prophets, and then one apocalyptic narrative that is similar to the book of Revelation, which actually contains pieces and bits scattered about Daniel. But Daniel is apocalyptic because not only is he a prophet preaching more or less to the Jews about, hey, you know, I'm a follower of God, we're in Babylonian captivity. This is the way back to Yahweh. He's not only doing that, but he has this prophetic piece at the end really foretelling the end times, essentially, the, uh, the rapture, the, however you want to call it. And so going back to this biblical criticism, there's a lot of issues of was it written during the Babylonian exile or the Maccabean revolt? And there's about 400 years difference between the two. And just like quickly, it's, it's very divisive to say the least. Um, but, you know, it depends on which tradition you follow. Usually uh, the Catholic tradition will go with the Maccabean revolt, um, and the Protestant tradition will emphasize that it was actually written during the period it claimed to be written. While uh, it's like 622, 600s, whatever, when the Jews were actually exiled in Babylon. Um, and then it comes down to the uh, pseudepigraphal text. It was it actually written by Daniel or was it written like the second and third Isaiahs where it's like the original prophet wrote the first part and then like spiritual sons like Paul has their descendants essentially of this prophet who take on his name but in Jewish culture it's not considered uh, plagiarism or anything like that. It's just kind of normal it's what they do. So really, uh, to get even more divisive, is trying to understand, um, is this book full of allegory? Philosophical standpoint, that really what we're seeing is a projection of what is really real? Or is this really like sola scriptura? Like the word is the word is the word. It has nothing to do with like, oh, this is about like Caesar Nero or whatever, but it's like about what it says it's about. So that's just some criticisms of the book of Daniel. Really, what it's trying to communicate, despite all the criticisms and all the historical inaccuracies, is that God is a God of all nations and people, and that he communicates equally, more or less, uh, to the pagan nations as well as the God-fearing nations. That this mosaic that we call humanity is not just about I'm right, you're wrong, it's about how do we communicate Jesus Christ or Christ incarnate or Yahweh at this point in the Hebrew scriptures, how do we communicate that to everyone? So it has elements of liberation theology as well, trying to see really how how can we still be liberated with our religion in a nation that doesn't respect it and wants us to bow down to foreign idols and kings. It also shows us that God is not a God of territory. He's not just located in the Levant, but in the universal, is all powerful and all loving. So the significance of Daniel amongst the prophets is not that he's just 
a collection of oracles that we can see in some of the minor prophets where it's just teaching, teaching, teaching. And there's no personal connection with the actual prophet. There is actually a narrative in the book of Daniel kind of forming and really showing who this prophet is, whether it was someone that wrote it 400 years later or it was the actual account of the prophet Daniel. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't enter in as much as like we actually have a narrative instead of just your bad repent, repeat. And so similar to Jesus, Daniel actually shows us how to apply the laws of the Torah as Jesus did on you know, the Sermon on the Mount, stuff like that, that he actually applies it. As Hannah was talking about the feet washing, it's not just about the principle of what the law says, but he's taking and what Jesus is doing, essentially what Daniel did is we know the law. We know not to bow down to idols or eat food or foreign gods and stuff like that. So let's apply that in an actual setting instead of just repeating. So I designated uh, the typologies of Jesus in three different categories. The typology in reference to like biblical content is defined as one holding that things in Christian belief prefigured or symbolized by things in the Old Testament. So essentially, Daniel is a type of Jesus. And to me, one of the most important types, especially later on in the book, who I've designated is Daniel the Mirror, which is that he's a certain level of his personality is mirroring the life of Jesus and how he interacts with people. Daniel on the Mount, which is like the Sermon on the Mount of Daniel, that he's a similar purpose. He has a similar purpose and style of spiritual instruction. And then third is Daniel, friend of Jesus. And we'll get to the, what that really means later on. So Daniel the Mirror. The topic of this typology is power of obedience and denying one's flesh for the glory of God. So Daniel and his spiritual brothers refused to disobey the laws of the Torah by eating food sacrificed to idols by King Nebuchadnezzar. Instead, he requests to eat only vegetables and drink water for 10 days, have his countenance judged at the end by of this fasting period compared to those who have been eating food, who have been sacrificing to idols. We find at the end that Daniel and his friends appear fairer and fatter than those who continue to eat meat. And so because God or because Daniel was obedient to God, God rewards him and his friends with knowledge, wisdom. The same thing happens after Jesus goes through the desert, the wilderness, essentially. Jesus goes through this period of fasting, and at the end of it, the angels take him up and minister, the Bible says. Next is Daniel on the Mount. But the topic is Daniel as a prophet or the spokesman of God. And this is really centered in uh, Daniel 2 in Scripture that Daniel was a dream interpreter, having a power prophetic gifting, powerful prophetic gifting, which has the same emphasis with Joseph in the book of Genesis. But the same king who tested Daniel and his friends eating the food is now testing him and asking him to interpret his dreams. And so this is from Daniel chapter 2. It says, Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the su summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So Daniel kind of breaks down this dream that, okay, this, king, uh, this king's going to come after you, and after that king is going to come another king and another one. But he alludes to what Jesus said, or what John the Baptist prophesied, or no, it's actually Jesus in Matthew 3, that Jesus will thoroughly clean out, uh, God will clean out the threshing floor and gather his wheat to the barn, but he will burn up the chaff, with unquenchable fire. Jesus is coming 
to take down this king who is having this trouble drink, but is also previously making Daniel and his friends bow down to idols. So it's just Daniel is saying that these kings are stronger than you, they'll come after you. And the one that comes after them is even stronger than them, but there is one king who is stronger than all of them. And then Daniel, a friend of Jesus. So the topic is the faith of the friends of Daniel pleases God when they're thrown into the fiery furnace. He acts in their favor to display his sovereignty to the prideful earthly king. And the scriptures in Daniel 3 talk about how three, uh, the three friends of Daniel were tasked with or were threatened by bowing down to the king or being thrown into the fiery furnace. They choose not to bow down, and so he throws them into this furnace, which is seven times hotter than it normally is. And they're bound by hand and foot, thrown in there, but as he's looking in, he sees a fourth figure. And this figure is Jesus Christ, being a pre incarnate, as um, the Christian tradition believes. And that essentially the king is reduced to less of a man because he recognizes the power of God. He sees that the faith of these men in Yahweh has created something miraculous and unnatural. And the scripture says that he, when he looked into the furnace, he, said some, or he saw something like the Son of God or the Son of Man. And we see that in uh, Mark, sorry, Matthew 11, 27 and Mark 5, 7, that Jesus is labeled as the Son of God. That being a typology. And then Daniel 6 is kind of like a rapid fire leading up. It's it's mirroring essentially the death crucifixion and kind of the miraculous entrance of Jesus leading up to his death. That Daniel is threatened once again to worship idols. And these three um, men from the Council of Babylon will see him praying after they made the king decree that no one would bow down to anyone but the king. And so they find him praying three times that day, just as Jesus prayed three times in the Garden of Gethsemane. And then it accentuates to the point where Daniel's thrown into the lion's den because he refuses to repent and refuses to bow down to the king, so he's thrown into there just as Jesus is crucified and put in a grave. And what's really interesting is that the king really did not want to sentence Daniel just as Pontius Pilate did not want to crucify Jesus. And the stone they actually roll over both graves, they roll stone over both graves. The first one here is sealed with the king's signet ring. And with the crucifixion of Jesus, the tomb is sealed with the authoritativeness of Pilate. So there is this seal, like I read in the scripture, there is literally a seal for both rulers who have said, you know, enough is enough with these holy men. And the greatest thing after that is the following day, the king really felt bad about what he had done to Daniel. So he comes back, yells down the whole, Daniel, are you still alive? He says, yes, God saved me. And so he raises him up out of the tomb out of the den of lions, just as Jesus was risen up to the right hand of God. After Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, the day after he died, went to go see him, and angel said the same thing. He's alive. He hasn't died, just as Daniel said. I'm safe. I haven't been eaten alive by the lions. So, that's my presentation.